Good afternoon, folks, and welcome to the Dean's Public Engagement Lecture Series. We launched this lecture series uh, uh, last year to increase interaction between the College of Law community, the legal and business professions, and the broader public. Law school faculties and students don't talk enough to people working in the vineyards of law, government, and business. And my sense is that we have far more to learn from them, and sometimes they from us, than most folks realize. In keeping with that spirit, I am honored today that we are hosting Justice Thomas L. Kilbride, who was elected to the Illinois Supreme Court in 2000 and served as its Chief Justice from 2010 to 2013. During his tenure as Chief, Justice Kilbride launched several key initiatives to respond to 21st century changes in society. These included programs involving electronic court filings, cameras in the courtrooms of state circuit courts, and assistance to pro se litigants and non-native English speakers to help them better navigate the judicial system. He also vigorously advocated for stronger financial support from the legislature for probation services. Prior to his judicial service, Justice Kilbride was an attorney in Rock Island for more than 20 years. He is past board member, vice president, and president of the Illinois Township Attorneys Association. He is a charter member of the Illinois Pro Bono Center and a volunteer legal advisor for the Community Caring Conference and Quad City Harvest. In 2010, the Illinois State Crime Commission honored him with the award of excellence in the judiciary. His topic today, judicial elections, is incredibly important and incredibly timely. The last decade has seen many high-profile controversies involving how elected state judges may be influenced on the bench by their donors. And yet executive nomination, Senate confirmation, and lifetime tenure, the federal judicial model, has problems of its own, which might explain why no state has fully copied the federal constitution in this regard. Concerning the federal approach, Politics isn't necessarily wrung out of the system so much as it, as it is telescoped into decisions about when particular justices choose to retire. Meanwhile, presidents, in order to extend their influence past their presidencies, have incentives to pick candidates who may be younger than is optimal and candidates who have little paper trail so that the confirmation process goes more smoothly. But people who have little paper trail on controversial matters often also haven't thought a lot about them. So just as law schools and, prof and the professions can learn more from each other, so too for both the state and federal systems. I'm not sure either one uh, has a monopoly on wisdom in this arena. So with that, it's my pleasure to turn the podium over to Justice Kilbride. Unless, I think maybe that's for purposes of filming. Okay. I was going to say good morning, but good afternoon. I got to turn this uh, <coughs> other. Yeah, I got to get my glasses on first. Okay, I think that's on. Uh, I'm happy to be here, I think. I, uh, the last time I was in this room, uh, I argued a case before the Seventh Circuit U.S. Court of Appeals. And those of you who have done that or witnessed that, you might think, I do have shock, memory shock. I can't remember exactly. <laughs> All I know is I wasn't that happy to be here then. <laughs> but uh, Dean Amar, I thank you for the introduction and Assistant Dean Carolyn Turner. I want to thank you effusively for all of your assistance and if she's uh, due for a pay raise, I, I'm going to endorse that. Uh, and professor, <laughs> uh, professor Bradley, uh, I don't know that he's here, but uh, uh, I want to thank him for initiating this invitation today. And, and before I begin my remarks, I wanted to deviate on f two other little comments. One is this is National Pro Bono Week all across the United States. And uh, I, I, for one, happen to be a strong believer and promoter of pro bono. And, and for, for those of you who are able to participate, I encourage you to do that. And uh, I think you'll reap many benefits. And I see uh, Mark Benfield from uh, the Quad City area who's here. Mark. Uh, was a summer uh, judicial law intern for me this summer. He did a fabulous job, and, and uh, I want to thank him publicly for his assistance. I appreciate getting to see you today, too. Uh, it's my pleasure 
uh, to speak with all of you uh, today about judicial elections and, and uh, what I frame as the constitutional conflicts emanating from elections. And the disclaimer is this, there may be, in addition to the dean, one or two law professors here, and I'm not a law professor, so I'm not gonna venture into any lecture on substantive law. But I wanna talk about also professional responsibility issues that flow out of judicial elections. And I've given this talk a few times. Uh, some of you may have run across a, a law school colleague from John Marshall called uh, Clifford Scott uh, Rudnick, uh, who's involved with the ABA on professional responsibility. That's where I first met him. And, and I asked him, I, I didn't have a title for this, but Carolyn and her folks uh, insisted I come up with a title. So I said to Professor Rudnick, what would you call it? And he says, uh, uh, darned if you do and darned if you don't. I would have used a different D word. Uh, <laughs> about Illinois Supreme Court elections. But my, the focus of my remarks really is what I call a real life script of constitutional conflicts. But here are the basic uh, constitutional critical benchmarks. In Illinois, <clears throat> under our Illinois Constitution of 1970, Article 3, Section 12A, and this is key, mandates elections for all judges with the exception of those associate judges who are appointed by the elected circuit judges on a circuit by circuit basis. Mandates, we don't have a choice, it's mandated in the Illinois Constitution. Also in Article 3, Section 12a, it mandates that judges run on a partisan political basis. You can't run for judge except on a partisan political basis. And the conflict begins to come in because of another uh, provision that's mandated uh, by the First Amendment, free speech rights that uh, include negative advertising that creates, I want to say, constitutional conflict. And it all flows from the 2010 case in Citizens United, uh, 558 U.S. 310, that's opened the bank teller drawers to a huge flow of campaign cash. Uh, as it played out for me, I survived a judicial retention election that was on November 2 of 2010, just almost six years ago. And as many of you know, in Illinois, once you're elected as a judge in a contested race between two living candidates, you have to stand uh, for retention. And that means a, you're not running against a person, but you're running against a threshold of 60% as mandated in the state of Illinois Constitution, which, by the way, as I, my research tells me, it's the only state in Illinois where a judge for retention has to get 60% of the vote. That's not an easy thing. Uh, to necessarily to do. And I want to comment upon how criminal law rulings are used as wedge issues, how fighting for retention involves fighting against well-funded groups, and what, if anything, can be done about these constitutional conflicts. But I want to start with the premise that on judicial elections, I hold the premise true that uh, the court is where any person stands equal with any other party in court. And I also believe that the bedrock principles of fairness, impartiality, and equal justice for all. But judicial elections are challenging judicial independence and the promise of our courts to deliver fair, impartial, and equal justice. And looking back, before I ran in 2010, I had an inkling that I might be challenged. This is before there was any any noise. When I raised the specter of that with friends, they all thought I suffered from the usual candidate worry of the possible infinitesimal opposition in the face of long-standing history in the state of Illinois of what they call softball retention. When 80% at a minimum comes in to say yes, when you do nothing, when you stay quiet and you draw no attention. And of course, in the history of that, it seems safe when you have no opponent. But about a year before the election in 2010, some special interest groups were making noise that they would raise one and a half million to oust me from the court. Now here's the catch. With traditional quiet elections of 80% retention, meaning that, again, you don't do anything and people will vote for you, but that also means 20% are voting no and nobody's asking them to vote no. So. The opposition would surmise, all we need to do is find another 20% plus one more vote, and the judge is off the bench, 
out the door and we get a clean shot with the new, new election at 50%. On top of that, in 2010, if you think back, that was a year, hard to believe that when you think about what's going on now in 2016, but it was the year of throw out the incumbents. It was the year of the, the rise of the Tea Party in the United States that was running across the country. And if you look at the congressional races in the state of Illinois of who were incumbents and who got tossed out and how I did at 60% vis-a-vis how those folks did, I did fairly well. And in Iowa, that was 2010, uh, that was the year three justices on the Iowa Supreme Court were tossed off of the court. And the other interesting factor that impacted me is that I live in the Quad Cities. My district includes 21 counties in north, north central Illinois from the Iowa border to the Indiana border. Basically, if you know the geography, across Interstate 80 south, uh, just south of Peoria, uh, touching uh, the Quincy, Adams County area. And it runs over here for just above your county, above Livingston County into Kankakee, Iroquois County on the east. But in the Quad Cities, a major media market for the state of Iowa, they targeted the Iowa justices and the local uh, conservative Fox radio talk show host would bash all of the Iowa justices, and before he would finish, he'd say, now just to, don't forget that guy over in Illinois, Kilbride. You gotta throw him out too. So, you know, that, it's, it's really a fun to hear that on the radio when you're home, well, getting ready to walk into the grocery store. Um, in a larger context, as the dean mentioned, this is all part of an escalating trend. And if you look at what happened in April of 2011, in the Wisconsin Supreme Court, Supreme Court race that garnered national attention with nasty mudslinging. And this was on the heels uh, of what was the uh, Governor uh, Walker legislative standoff. That was a $3 million race uh, in the state of Wisconsin between two challengers on an open, not a retention race. And it is part of a national trend that's been going on. If you include what's pending now and what's been going on over basically the last 15 years, and these are the states where big money has, has come to play. Alabama, Arkansas, Florida, Kansas, Kentucky, Louisiana, Michigan, Mississippi, New Mexico, North Carolina, Ohio, Pennsylvania, Tennessee, Texas, Washington, West Virginia, and as I mentioned, uh, Wisconsin, where it's the subject of big money challenges with significant out-of-state funds to turn around a court, the composition of a court. And there are some special interests who view it as good business. Some acknowledge the separation of powers in our structure of the constitutional form of government, and they will no longer ignore the courts, the quiet, out of sight, third branch. And this is at state Supreme Court levels. And in fact, for those of you who might occasionally <coughs> watch public television, you might know the name Bill Moyer, M-O-Y-E-R. He has a show, at least he did, I don't know if it's still on. But I remember after Citizens United came out in 2010, uh, and I remember this because we were headed to take a week's vacation before I started uh, up on some campaigning. And uh, it was that, that, I think of the last show he had in the week of uh, February of 2010. And he had the one, uh, uh, I can't remember what university in DC law professor who was a CNN law commentator. I'd know his name if I heard it, but uh, he was on the show. And they both talked about how Citizens United would come to play in state Supreme Court elections and that people were not paying attention. But here's how it, it, it plays out from, from the opposition. Uh, it's more economical and smarter to protect a legislative agenda in the courts when you think about the millions of dollars that are spent to first elect legislators and the millions of dollars spent to elect governors. Why do they want to lose it all in the courts? In fact, they think they can spend less money and shaping the influence of courts and protect what they do in the legislative races. As I mentioned before, I live in Rock Island County and, and the big three, I was a Bulls fan, so I like to refer to this as the triangle offense of the, the years of Michael Jordan when it's the, uh, the, the key potatoes are in the Quad Cities, Will County, Joliet, south of Chicago, and Peoria. You know that saying that said if it plays in Peoria, well, uh, that's one of the, the key areas. But in Rock Island County, my home county, I was only targeted with negative mail that I heard about uh, by friends and, and folks who were in the community. In Will County, it was the same mail 
But there were also radio ads playing out of Chicago on WLS and WGN. And then radio ads also played elsewhere within the district on smaller stations. And in Peoria, it was the big three. It was the mail, it was radio, and they actually did TV commercials against me. We're going to uh, show you some of that here in a moment. And throughout the district, whether it's Peoria, Rock Island, or, or uh, Will County, negative emails were sent out. And again, I would hear this from people who said, you know, I talked to so-and-so who is a member of this organization, and they got an email saying that you're you know, the best friend that's come along since uh, uh, Jack the Reaper, or whatever the, the, the phrase is. But the crux of the attack was a focus on criminal opinions. And in uh, 2014, uh, my colleague on the court, Justice Lloyd Carmeier, who's soon to be uh, the new next Chief Justice. And by the way, we only serve as Chief for three years at a time. So um, uh, he's going to come in on Halloween Day, October 31st. And if uh, Carolyn's ready, we're going to show you the first clip of uh, uh, something that John Oliver showed on his national TV show on Showtime. The problem with an elected judiciary is sometimes the <laughs> right decision is neither easy nor popular. And yet, campaigns force judges to look over their shoulder on every move. Because while political attack ads can be aggressive, judicial attack ads can be downright horrifying. I was convicted of stabbing my victims with a kitchen knife. Well, shooting my ex girlfriend and murdering her sister in front of our child. Sexual assault on a mom and a 10 year old daughter. Then I slashed her throats. On appeal, Justice Thomas Kilbride sat in with us. Over law enforcement or victims. Oh my god. <laughs> Good luck getting back into whatever you were watching after seeing that commercial. <laughs> Sheldon and his friends are going to have to get into some pretty wacky mishaps to wipe the memory of that away. Well, that is uh, entertaining <laughs> to look at now, but I can tell you I was not uh, smiling when those ads were on the TV at all. Um, they were uh, false, misleading, distorting my votes on cases. Uh, and I'll give you two examples. I'm not going to go through all three of those. But the three people in the uh, jail cell, one of them represented, I can't remember the names of the defendants now, but was a, a, a guy that <clears throat> I actually voted with the majority, but I wrote a spe special concurrence. So I, I was for the same result, which was basically, you know, keep the guy in jail and put him away. But I, I did not believe that mandamus, as I hope you learn about in law school, is not the proper remedy, or was not the proper remedy in that case. I thought, you know, we could do what we wanted to do if we used our constitutional authority of supervisory authority under the Illinois Constitution. But that was uh, a twisted because I didn't vote precisely with the majority 100%. They felt justified to say that I was, was off track and, and actually uh, said it was uh, pro-defendant. And then another case that came out of, I can't remember the name, I guess I should have looked it up, but out of uh, the Champaign area where there was a party on campus or off campus, but there were students, and uh, somebody complained and the police show up, and then there was a struggle at the door about letting the officer in, not letting the officer in, and the, somebody slammed the door on the officer's arm, and I forget exactly what else happened, but uh, two of us on the court, not the majority, but two of us thought th that it was proper to charge the case more seriously, a class up from what it was charged at. And, uh, and because, again, I didn't vote for the majority 100%, they took me and put me in this other category when they did this analysis and that was one of the examples of, of uh, a distortion. So maybe we do clip two. Now, now what those evil shadows are saying sounds awful, but here's the problem. None of those three men were actually set free by Judge Kilbride, but in each case he merely questioned the legality of procedural points in their trials, which is a judge's job. But there's no room in campaigns for nuance. That's why you don't see bumper stickers reading justice is complicated requiring the sublimation of our basic instincts, which, though difficult to be only separates us from the anarchy of beasts, killed by 2015. <laughs> Now, if anyone has an idea how I can get John Oliver to help me <laughs> on the next election, I'm looking to talk to this guy. I, uh, uh, I often tell this story when I <clears throat> am on the campaign trail. I'm, I'm the son of two parents who were born and raised on farms in uh, 
central Illinois. My mother was from Grundy County, if any of you have ever heard of that. And my dad was from Kankakee County, both farm kids. And, and uh, I used to go to my grandfather's farm every summer to work, to walk the bean fields, cutting the corn out and baling hay. And, and one uh, particular farm task I had was to ride the fertilizer tractor trailer. I mean, my grandfather Emmett was driving the, the tractor. He was hauling the, the, uh, the uh, fertilizer spreader is what it was and a manure spreader, and I had to shovel the stuff into the spreader. And it was, you know what it was, it was cow manure. You know what that is, right? It's uh, manure is another way of saying shit. So I, I was, I was my, my grandfather said, you know, I don't know what you're gonna grow up and be. I was 10 years old at the time. He said, Tommy, I don't know what you're gonna grow up and be, but whatever you become, shoveling this shit's good experience for you. So <laughs> I say that because, you know, <laughs> things in the elections are not pristine by any means, but, uh, I want to say this, that the evolution of judicial politics morphing into typical elections is bad for everyone. It threatens judicial independence, it threatens confidence in our court system, and it spoils civic participation. Clip three. Now, keep in mind in context, this is part of a whole show. Uh, the reference to judges comparing themselves to prostitutes was not with reference to me. <laughs> and, uh, but, and I've got nothing against John Deere. In fact, I have a John Deere lawn and garden tractor that I still use. Um, and I, you know, people contribute, corporations contribute money to organizations and they don't always know how the money's gonna be used, but in any event, there is a lot of money out there on both sides of, of the aisle. And uh, what I want to say, too, is that the election of judges, at least in my mind, does not equate to the election of bad judges. And I've learned something about judicial elections that outside the candidate, whether it's you know the judicial candidate, there's three groups of people. There are the political consultants and their staff. There's the political observers, those who write these columns and go on TV and and so forth. And then there's the voters. But a candidate has to survive in the midst of the political grind of an election. And most consultants, campaign staff, are completely unfamiliar with how the judiciary works. The, the idea of a judicial code of conduct is a foreign object in a foreign language. And to survive, judges are forced to walk the plank, walk on political hot coals, and think like a political candidate while maintaining judicial independence. And I remember having to uh, fight with my campaign staff over the language that we put, they wanted to put into uh, uh, mail pieces that were gonna be sent out. And I said, you know, I can't be portrayed as taking a position on cases. I know it makes sense for you to take an opinion and, and try and spin it, but we just can't do that. So that, that's not fun, not fun by any means. So I wanna show you, uh, before we do this, the next clip in just a second. And you're going to wonder why the heck am I showing you this, but I'll explain and, and there's, there's a reason for it. So just bear with me. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, I don't endorse Red Bull, 
In fact, I, I'm going to make this disclaimer. You ought to don't, don't drink those energy drinks. I'm not a doctor, but I have a good friend who used to drink that stuff all the time. He had a heart attack, so at least Google it before you drink it. Now, why am I showing you that? Well, I like to say I have no particular reason. I just wanted you to see what one of the songs that I might have on my playlist. But I, uh, as I said, I was uh, uh, a big Red, uh, not Red, Chicago Bulls fan. And I remember a few years ago when they, Dean, when they were actually in the playoffs, the Chicago Bulls. They used to win the playoffs. Yeah, I know. And uh, well, the commercials, they had a cut out, cutaway in the NBA, and they were playing this song. He said, what is that song? I really like the beat of it. And uh, I found out it was a song called Come Get It Bay, B-A-E, Bay, not Babe. And I know what that means, by the way, uh, by a guy named Pharrell Williams, who used to be one of the judges on The Voice uh, as of last year, but he's no longer a judge on The Voice. But I show that uh, for two reasons. One is that the frenetic, high speed, high pace that's shown, illustrated on that, is kind of like what it's like when you're the candidate. You don't see this on the outside, but when you're on the inside doing a campaign and you've got people coming at you from right and left and you've got the latest news of the latest attack ad that's coming out and people are trying to tell you you've got to do this to survive, it's a big rush in the face that a person as a judicial candidate has got to stand strong, stand calm in the midst of turbulence to try and make the right decisions. And in the practice of law, because I, I did practice for 20 years before I got on the court in 2000, and when I look back, and I always say this to law students at, at law schools, that uh, when I look back, I know I've made mistakes, and it's when I went too fast. And I'm not saying you want to slow down so slow that you don't get work done, but it's very important to go carefully, to think things through, and not be pushed to the point where you're going to make a decision to take a shortcut when you uh, don't want to take a shortcut. So let me kind of begin to, to wrap up here uh, by saying that negative politics, they say, works, but it really doesn't work. But here's how the positive of negative is. It succeeds because it dampens and diminishes voter turnout. And one example is what happened to me in the Quad Cities again in 2010 when there was so much negative advertising on TV uh, all kinds of, of bad stuff. And a, a woman wrote a letter to the editor, and she complained about all the negativity. And she said, but the one campaign advertisements that I think are good are this guy, Judge Kilbride. And what did she conclude with? But I'm not going to vote anyway. Great. We spend all this money to try and get people to come out, and this woman understands the difference, and she doesn't even want to vote. So perception is reality. And big money creates perceptions not grounded in reality. And in 2003, after I first was elected, I decided to, to try and become physically fit. And I was out riding a bicycle, not a motorcycle, a bicycle. And after the, uh, we finished our May court term, I came home and was going to get back at my, my routine and get out on the bike in the morning. I got up at 6 o'clock, headed out the driveway down our 23rd Avenue, and I, the bike crashed. Had a terrible accident. Ended up with four surgeries. I smashed my, my elbow, my hip, my, my shoulder. Had 26 screws put in me, as I said, you know, in, in my elbow, four in my hip and four in my shoulder. So, you know, what they could have said and been true is that Kilbride is all screwed up. But <laughs> they didn't do that. So, you know, fortunately in the campaign, I received strong support in a bipartisan fashion across the board. Uh, People, in, even in the legal community, or I shouldn't say even, in the, but, but in law enforcement, prosecutors, when they saw these ads, they stood up and spoke out uh, for me. It's kind of hard to have criminal defendants get up and stand up, and, but we didn't need them <laughs> in the formula. But I had a district-wide coalition from the Illinois State Bar, the Chicago Bar, the Illinois Judges Association, the American Board of Travel, Trial um, Advocates, uh, the Chicago Tribune, the Sun-Times, the Peoria Journal Star, the, and that year, they actually advocated for ouster of one of the appellate court judges, deans of private law schools, because the public law schools were not allowed to endorse. Uh, Governor Chim Jim Thompson, National Fact Check Organization, caught wind of this and came out and published reports. But what can be done about this? Um, I don't really know if much can be done in light of 
the holdings of the U.S. Supreme Court. Uh, we have to live with those. Citizens United opens the gates. It's determined to be f uh, speech, spending of money. And who decides on appointments? When you look back at the history in Illinois with at least two governors, Governor Ryan and Governor Blagojevich, people would question, no, do we, would we have wanted those governors uh, to appoint? And just recently, I don't know where I put it, I brought it with me. There's an editorial uh, on uh, October 15th from the Washington Post that criticized Hillary Clinton. And it's, it's labeled, How Not to Pick a Supreme Court Justice. And they started their editorial by saying the very first sentence, and quote, this is Hillary Clinton speaking, I have very clear views about what I want to see kind of change the balance of the Supreme Court, close quote. Then she goes on to say, quote, I do have a litmus test. I have a bunch of litmus tests because the next president could get as many as three appointments, period, close quote. Now that's what Hillary's saying. I'm not criticizing her, but that's what she said in the Washington Post is right. I mean, we may be in a quandary, whether it's an appointed situation or, or you have to free stand and, and run for election. Uh, what I'm wondering, and I don't, I don't have this, you know, th this is a request maybe, Dean, you can run with with your, uh, your, your colleagues, but, uh, uh, you know, you wonder in the balance, when we go back and you look at that case out of West, now was, I don't know if it was West Virginia, I think it was West Virginia, the Mass Massey case, the Cole case. Um, and it was decided that the judge, I mean, the challenge, if I remember correctly, was about whether or not the judge should recuse himself because one of the participants, litigants in the case, was the big coal company that had given, I don't know, 90 plus percent of all the money that he raised uh, to run for election. And uh, on the, the, the premise, the doctrine of the right to a free trial, in the sense that you have a fair trial, I should say a fair trial, uh, they said that violates due process. Okay, that's fine, and, but, but here's the problem. You have not just me, any judge who's going to get attacked. Um, and you as voters have to listen and wade through all the, the nonsense that's out there that distorts the truth. What are your rights as citizen voters? And if we believe in free elections, does free elections, and that's a constitutional principle, I, I believe, uh, does due process protect that, that? That as a voter, you have the right to be, to, to get to the answer about how, whom you're going to select, whom you're going to vote for. Uh, I don't know if there's any way to constitutionally protect that as a way to curb the spending. I mean, if they weigh things in balance, can, is there a way to curb the spending? Because if so, uh, you know, in an ideal world, I'd like to see no money spent. I'd like to say, you know, Kilbride, you want to run for office? You, you spend 5,000 bucks of your own money, and that's it. Um, anybody else wants to talk, you can find. But, you know, forget the TV ads, forget all the mailers. Just go out and talk and, and, and meet people. But in any event, uh, that's where we are, and that's what I wanted to share, and uh, I hope that made sense. I want to also say, I usually say this at the beginning, but I'm very fond of coming to uh, law schools to talk because uh, without any prompting by me, my daughter, middle daughter, I have three daughters, the one in the middle, she decided on her own to go to law school after she had graduated. Anybody here from Augustana College by chance? All right. She, uh, my wife teaches mathematics there, and she's the, she's the smart one in the family. And, uh, but all three of my daughters went to Augustana College, and Colleen, the middle daughter, uh, did that and then worked with the Jesuit volunteer group for two years doing immigration work as a paralegal. And then she's been out doing a real job. I shouldn't say a real job. She'd kill me if I said that. But uh, she... Uh, I was working with an insurance company, and now she's going to night school. She's in her fourth year of night school, so she's going to graduate this May. So I have a great affinity to, to law students. So that's what I've got to say, and I hope it was of some interest. Thank you.